Hey there. Let me push, I've pushed record so we can have another go. <clears throat> Let's okay. Call the reserves are mere farce. That's a quote from William Thomas, Assistant Protector, um, to the Port Phillip District uh, in Victoria from 1839 to 1863, I think, the Pound Bend Depot uh, in Warren Dyke. Robert Hoddle, Surveyor General for the Port Phillip District, was tasked with naming its new parishes after the local Aboriginal clan's name for a prominent natural feature in each area. In a place name list of 1837 that he probably derived from George Langhorn, um, who was the Wesleyan missionary over the mission where the Botanical Gardens now is, he jotted down the Woiwurrung name Nilam Bick for an area in Melbourne's outer north. Its meaning is given as where the ground is bad or unfit for agriculture or grazing purposes. Hoddle or Langhorn either made his own judgment or Wurundjeri people gave him this meaning as a decoy to ward off settler incursion onto their homelands. Their country was bounded by waterways that emptied into the Birrarung Yarra River. As the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural uh, Heritage Aboriginal Corporation explains, now creeks and rivers mark the boundaries between Kulin nations. The contemporary shire of Nilambik takes the Birrarung Yarra River as its southern boundary and extends nearly 30 kilometres to King Lake National Park in the north. Over 30 scar trees have been identified in archaeological surveys of Nilambik. The bark carefully leveraged in sheets for, from trees for canoes, sheltered shields and kulamons. Scar trees signposted a songline route along the Birrarung Yarra River to guide travellers and uh, to sing for country to regenerate. As well as these scar trees, several artefacts scatters, quarries and stone traps have been documented, attesting to the cultivation of the area by traditional custodians. Even more sites became visible after the area was raised in the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires. This region of Melbourne's outer north on Wurundjeri country has been largely overlooked in histories of settler incursion onto Aboriginal lands. The story of settler take-up of northern Wurundjeri country is starkly illuminated when set against the opening and closing of some of the Port Phillip Aboriginal reserves. When the Port Phillip Protectorate was established in 1839, the government allocated each of the four assistant protectors a reserve site for the local clans they were to oversee. Within the greater metropolitan area of Melbourne, reserve sites existed on the south bank of the Birrarung Yarra at Yarrup Hills, just north of Sunbury, where the protectorate took over some of the previous took over some of the one of the previous Anglican mission sites, and at Narrow Narrow Warren on the site of the of an earlier Native Police paddock. Another important site, though it was never formalised, was that of the Mary Creek Aboriginal School at Yarra Bend, which was used as a makeshift Aboriginal station by Assistant Protector William Thomas. To reserve is to retain something for future use. It is to stash, store or cash something of value, sometimes in a hidden or inaccessible place, which is not needed for immediate use. What becomes clear from the allocation of reserves in the Port Phillip district is what was actually being reserved and for whom. These slivers of land were not reserved for the benefit of the people. They were intended to save, preserve from extinction, but as it invariably transpired for future uses by settler and settlers and the colonial government. If these remnant populations were to be preserved, it was conditional also on their being coerced onto these sites and thereby conduced into settled habits and Christianity. The allocation and decline of camps and reserves in the Port Phillip district is indicative of the rapid expansion of this frontier in what became the colony of Victoria in 1851. This article offers an account of these contested grounds, taking the Pound Bend Reserve at Warren Dyche as its case study. In 1839, the first government survey of Melbourne's outer north was carried out by T.R. Nutt, but already three settlers had bought squatting licences and set themselves up along uh, the Birrarung Yarra River. They were Major Charles Newman, who in 1838 had a sheep run on Mullum Mullum Deep Creek, Creek in Templestowe, James Anderson, 
with his cattle run on Bill Yalek, or now Anderson's Creek, in 1839 at Warrandyte, and the brothers John and William Wood, who settled on the Bolan Bulleen Lagoon Flats. Newman and Anderson were known to shoot at people with to shoot at Aboriginal people with intent to kill they were said to be ruthless in their disposition of the Wurundjeri so I'm standing on the bridge of this this picture I'm standing on the bridge of Anderson Creek uh, to the, the one on the left looks up the creek and the one on the right looks down the creek where it joins with um, Birrarung the Yarra River that's just down river from Camp from Warrandyte and right next to uh, the Pound Bend uh, area. The Wurundj Wurundjeri are a, an Aboriginal nation of the Woiwurrung language group in the Kulin Alliance. Wurundjeri Woolen clan country comprises the Birrarung Yarra River Valley. Wurundjeri derives from the words Warren, meaning white manor gums that grew along the river flats, and Jerry, referring to the edible grubs found in their roots. They were part of a larger language group language group, the Woiwurrung, whose territory took in the basin of the Birrarung Yarra River and all the streams flowing into it. They occupied the area south of the Yarra from Gardner's Creek past the northern slopes of the Dandenongs to the upper Yarra. Wurundjeri clans cultivated land extending over some 12,000 square kilometres for millennia. They were comprehensively dispossessed and survivors assigned to small reserves within a few short years of European incursion. All along southern southeastern watercourses, such as the Birrarung, Yarra, and Plenty Rivers, and the Arthurs, Anderson, and Diamond Creeks. Diamond Creek is where my sister's home was lost on Black Saturday fires. Aboriginal aquaculture engineering, such as eel and fish traps, abounded. But many of these works were invisible to European eyes, deliberately overlooked, or if noted, destroyed. The riverfront area of the Warrandyte Township, for instance, was originally a 300 metre long Wurundjeri Willem aquaculture area complete with fish traps and fish, freshwater mussel and yabby farms. Wherever the native hop appeared in large clusters along the creeks was an indication of crab holes. As a regularly visited camping site, the river flats would have been partially cleared of undergrowth to make way for meands or shelters. The native grass, Lamandra, was likely harvested there to weave baskets and traps. Just north of nearby Kilmore, greenstone diorite was mined at Mount William Quarry and traded for hatchet heads or hatchet blanks as far afield as Wollongong and Adelaide. A permanent presence was maintained at the quarry site by Gunnam Willem Bullock Narangata, or cultural leader or clan head, um, Ning Ningalabal and his sons, and was this, who was assisted by Wurundjeri Willem custodian Narangata Bilabellary. The quarry was used for more than 1,500 years and covered 18 hectares, including underground pits of several metres. The eel estuaries of Bullen or Bulleen Billabong were also critically important to Wurundjeri. The eel period, the eel migration period in late February and early March brought Wurundjeri clans to the area seasonally. Along with sheltering areas for eels, they maintained deep water pools as the breeding ponds for blackfish and yabbies. These were near a sacred women's site at, Barna, at Bargiong Brushy Creek, which is now Witten's Reserve, where new babies were welcomed. Um, Maram Tarat Kuruk coming of age ceremonies were also performed there. But by February 1841, while camping near Ryrie Station at Burrurong Yarra River, so that's Victoria's first vineyard and a few runs up from Anderson and the Pound Bend on the Yarra, um, the clans complained that they needed to move camp because the area was already depleted of wood and all gone eels. Settler take up of these river and creek allotments was catastrophic for the Wurundjeri Willem, but they never ceased and they continue to harvest, regenerate, fire and sing their lands in Melbourne's outer north. Bounty has been cultivated here by Wurundjeri for, for at least 1,600 generations. The waterways were also the first areas to be occupied by settlers who in no time were complaining. The blacks are still lurking about the creeks. As such, at such sites, both parties mutually regarded each other as intruders. New heading, Port Phillip. The new district of Port Phillip was, had been established in September 1836, just before a British Parliamentary Select Committee handed down a damning report in February 1837 on the treatment of Aboriginal tribes in the British settlements. 
The Select Committee's report was dubbed the Aborigines Report and it documented widespread frontier violence in the British colonies. The Secretary of the Colonial Office, Lord Glenelg, had this foremost in mind when he wrote to recently appointed Governor of New South Wales, George, George Gipps, to impress upon him the importance of stamping down on frontier violence through applying the law, the rule of law prosecuting European shepherds, whalers, sailors and escaped convicts and preaching Christianity to natives by way of civilising. He noted, we owe the natives a debt given the fixed rate of 12 shillings an acre had already, already amassed some £100,000 sterling for the Sydney Treasury without any recompense to the ancient occupiers of the soil. In Port Phillip, the native tribes were to be recompensed with religious instruction, uh, protectors and missionaries. An actual treaty, Glenelg claimed, would be inexpedient due to disparities between the, the, between the parties' sagacity in civil policy. Perhaps chafing within these contradictions, Glenelg announced in January 1838 that a protectorate would be established in the nascent district of Port Phillip. He advised the appointment of George Robinson, the reputed conciliator of the tribes of Van Diemen's Land, along with four assistant protectors, one of whom was William Thomas. Just an aside, I went into public records and had a look at uh, Robinson's letters and in there was a very interesting reference that he was very much wanting to bring all of the, uh, you know, inhabitants of Waibalina to Victoria. He ended up bringing 20 because he didn't want the page of history to close as kind of finally on their, on their demise there. So that was part of his strategy. Um, William Thomas, in the meantime, had actually been involved in the abolition of slavery movement in London, and he was tapped on the shoulder. He was a clergyman. He was tapped on the shoulder by um, a lady, an aristocrat, to, to, to take up this position. Thomas was to oversee the Western Port District, which reached as far north as the Yarra Basin and took in the township of Melbourne. Each protector was to attach himself as closely and constantly as possible to the Aboriginal tribes until they can be induced to assume more settled habits of life. Glenelg did not specify where. Paradoxically, the protectors were also to watch over the right, their rights and interests, protect them from any encroachment on their property, which in this instance did not seem to refer to land. Again, without specifying where, Thomas should induce in any considerable number to uh, induce in any considerable number to locate themselves in a particular place, teach and encourage them to engage in the cultivation of their grounds in building suitable habitations. Yet Glenelg did not at this stage order that any land be set aside for them, though in principle he agreed with the establishment of a reserve if necessary. These were contradictory and poorly provisioned instructions. Given the people to be protected and civilised when acknowledged to have property and land, no place was set aside for them to cultivate. Originally, the previous Governor of New South Wales, Richard Burke, had sought the advice of Justice Burton of the New South Wales Supreme Court, who in 1835 recommended every township should have a portion reserved for the Blacks, along with land reserved for Black villages. Similarly, the missionary George Langhorn in 1835 had pressed the colonial secretary for stores or ration stations to be set up in all the districts. In 1837, Langhorn established a village mission that distributed rations on a large site stretching some 362 hectares along the Birrarung Yarra River, overlooking an encompassing part of now Melbourne's Royal Botanical Gardens. Langhorn had rationed and enrolled 20 boys in his school. Um, mostly Wurundjeri, with their families visiting regularly. But the children and their families continued to fulfil their duties to kinship and ceremony, and the boys were sometimes described by Langhorn as truant, running in rags and filth in the town and committing petty crimes. By around August 1839, Coolin were avoiding Langhorn's mission due to influenza and perhaps deaths on the site. In May, Chief Protector Robinson had recorded the deaths of five Coolin from dysentery and a little girl of about eight years from venereal, though it was possibly yours. Robinson wrote to Latrobe when he arrived in March, I found the Aborigines in a most deplorable condition. Disease, destitution and wretchedness prevailed in an alarming extent. The Wesleyan uh, Reverend Orton noted some of the people in the township were almost in a state of starvation and can only 
obtain food by day by begging or hunting. The latter mode is, however, almost abandoned on account of their game being driven away by the encroachment of settlers and the routes on which they are used partially to feed being destroyed by sheep. To make matters worse, there were two scuffles on Langhorne's mission with shots fired when police attempted to apprehend clansmen for the theft of potatoes and sheep. Jin Jin and Wurundjeri warrior Tula Main, so Tala Marina, were detained uh, but set fire to the thatched roof of the temporary jail across the Burrangyara River, actually in Collins Street, and escaped. The reserve was closed later that year. Although much of it was sectioned off for sale, its closure did not prevent Coolan from staying there. Indeed, part of it was taken over by Assistant Protector William Thomas and correspondence to protectors, I noticed in Prov, continue to be addressed to this central camp. This first in a series of closed or repurposed missions and reserves was an attempt to segregate and isolate mostly Wurundjeri and Bunurong people from the Kulin nations, along with visiting, visiting Wadawurrung, Tungurung and Jajawurrung people from the township of Melbourne, where they were typecast by colonial authorities as pilferers, truants, vagrants, prostitutes and trespassers. The closure of Langhorne's mission and the later selection of new outlying reserves were part of the unrelenting attempts required of all the protectors to, to discourage the clans from coming to the Melbourne, into the Melbourne township. Other church missions were further aflung, the Wesley and Buntingdale, um, the Moravian Lake Boga, Ebenezer, Ramayuk, and the Anglican Yalta, Framlingham and Lake Tyres. Many Kulin families today trace their lineage back through families removed to or seeking refuge on these missions and government reserves. So they were cru crucial to Kulin survival, yet abysmally, abysmally under provision and mostly short lived. From our perspective, it seems bitterly ironic that the clans being dispossessed were ordered to cultivate and assumed settled habits on reserves that were continually opened and then shut down. If anything, we might think of them as destabilizing, unsettling zones that fleetingly offered refuge and protection for a people reeling when there were few places of sanctuary left available to them. Next heading, Narrow Narrow Warren. By May 1839, all the assistant protectors were in their allotted districts, aside from Thomas, who was retained in Melbourne for clerical assistance to Robinson. The conditions in the town camps around Melbourne, as we've heard, were dire. And Thomas continually attempted to dissuade the clan's presence, yet work, barter, curiosity, guns and bread drew them in. Moreover, the grounds of Melbourne had long been a significant meeting area for Wurundjeri and Bunurong clans to conduct trade ceremony, ceremony and judicial processes, and even for the further afield clans of Tungurung, Jajawurrung and Wadawurrung. Thomas noted the significance of Melbourne's grid central position for Kulin and its role in their judicial proceedings to settle their grievances, usually by relatives of the aggrieved. Assistant Protector E.S. Parker, whose district took in some of the Woiwurrung, noted in his report of April 1839, that the only occasions where they assemble in any considerable numbers are when they resort to particular spots where some kind of food may be abundant for a season or to places abounding in fish or the, or the Mianong route. And when different tribes meet to settle disputes by conflict or otherwise, this appears to be almost invariably in the vicinity of Melbourne, he says. The site, in fact, comprised prime ceremonial hunting grounds. Settlers arriving with sufficient capital, some of whom were perhaps compensated slavers after abolition or investors in slavery, squatted on Crown land until the colonial government made provision for the granting of limited freehold title in the late 1840s. Indeed, in 1840, the government declared that eight square miles of crown land could be purchased for one pound an acre by any approved person, provided that the block was at least five miles from a surveyed township. By 1839, just as the assistant protectors were assuming their roles, they pressed for stations remote from the influences of Melbourne and selected by the tribes themselves to minister to the needs of the tribes. The establishment of any reserves was an uphill battle in many regards. Robinson had requested of Latrobe an establishment as a matter of common justice and for asylum from the widespreading encroachments and cupidity of the squatters. He knew of instances, instances where lynch law 
or violent expulsion was resorted to, wherein squatters chased people from their homes and native fires using mounted stockmen with bullock whips, absurdly imagining that their 10 pound license to squat on 20 to 40 acres, 40 miles, square miles of country conferred on them such rights. Thomas privately lamented in August 1839 that although tens of thousands have the last few months been realised from their land, not a blanket is to be given them in return. In December of that year, Thomas directly requested Gov Governor Gipps for a reserve more removed from Melbourne than Langhorne's recently closed mission of 895 acres. He argued no replacement land had been assigned after Langhorne's mission was closed, despite 255 of those acres being measured out in half acre allotments for sale. Thomas had privately despaired, had a long conversation with surveyor Mr Hoddle, showed me a map of the country, marked off into allotments comprising I think fully 30 square miles and not a single reserve for the blacks except the mission which I have no need to retain. I said that if a similar mission was uh, no wish to retain, so that's probably Langhorns. I said if, that if a similar map was exhibited to the people of England, they would at once see the way the natives are treated, their lands sold from under them, and no provision made for their maintenance, and this by the government who are bound to protect them. The rapid uptake of land by settlers was already precluding prospects for these government reserves. Thomas petitioned Gipps to, to cease special surveys in his district, such as that allotted to Frederick, Frederick Unwin, fronting the Birrarong, uh, Birrarong Yarra River at Templestowe, without first consulting him as protector. Probably don't need to see that. <laughs> Sorry. He noted the traditional seasonal camp um, at Bolan which had supported the Yarra Blacks one month in the year in Eels and it had been disposed of. They stayed there, he believed, for the last time in June 1841. He was ordered to break up this encampment by Robinson. Thomas wrote, I could not but feel for the poor Blacks. They had, till this visit, had an undisturbed range among the lagoons and supplied themselves amply for a month or five weeks. Now one side of the Yarra is closed to them forever. The two tribes had agreed on Bolin, their seasonal Ealing Lagoon, as a site for their new reserve, but Thomas wrote to Robinson that he'd rebuffed them due to four settlers being within five miles, insufficiency of game, and because of Bolin's proximity to Melbourne. They camped at Biel, back on this river here, on the banks of the Birrarung Yarra River, near Mr Henderson's place on the 2nd of March in 1841. So that's the first record we have of the Powderman Reserve. Both James Dawson and Anderson expressed preference, preference that the clans move on, Anderson needing to be pacified from his fear of the Blacks. We'll see why. We'll come to that. Nera Nera Warren Station had originally been selected by clansmen who had signed up for the first of four native police corps in 1837 and served from this base. It was known as an important hunting ground abounding with game near Curram Swamp, which was full of eels and under giant red gums embellished with large native figures. Clough's wife, Reverend Clough's wife nearby, complained the new station would infringe on their run. But Simon Wonga, um, Billa Bellary's son, advised Thomas that selecting a reserve any further out would deprive the clans of sufficient water supplies. Plus, it had been a fond encampment a long time ago. Thomas pressed Robinson for this selection and Narra Narra Warren Station was granted in June 1840. By 1842, Thomas had become exasperated at the, the clan's continual seasonal and ceremonial departures from his station at Narra Narra Warren. In his third quarterly report for 1842, Thomas recommended that the blacks might be taken up as vagrants in Melbourne. That's how much he wanted them out of town. Yet their labour was in demand in the township. Thomas got a promise from Latrobe for land for a reserve near his son's station on the Mary Creek, which became the Yarra Bend Camp in April 1840. Thomas operated a school from there for 10 years from 1841. This is right near Dites Falls, yet it was never formally recognised, this reserve. As the clans moved between camps, Thomas pressed again for regional reserves, but by August 1841, he was lamenting their reserves a mere farce. By December 1841, Billy Yabby Hamilton, clan leader of the Nebelak, 
explained Narrow Narrow Warren Station wasn't his country. He was um, Tungarong. Mount Sugarloaf was Tungarong country, but there they had no homestead, he said. They must have looked upon an abandoned station they came across near Mount Sugarloaf, Sugarloaf that year, ruefully. In October, he said, there was no game in their country, and whenever they camped, white men told them to be off, accused the women of stealing potatoes, and sent them to jail. He also said Neri Neri Warren's station was too far from their country and they were afraid of the wild blacks further south. That's the, the mob in Twofold Bay. Similarly, the Western Port blacks, Bunurong and Wadarong, said the station was too far from the sea and they could not catch fish there. Within a few years of its operation, the game at Neri Neri Warren's, Warren's station was said to be thin. By March 1842, the residents left, citing lack of water, saying they'd return when it rained. Neri Neri Warren would soon be abandoned. Thomas was ordered by Robinson to give it up in November 1843. Narangeta Bellary pressed Thomas for land for his people that they could cultivate from 1843. Both tribes promised to forego camping near Melbourne, it's a big promise, given what it meant to them. If Thomas could carry, could find country they wanted to stay on that could sustain them. In March 1849, Benbow actually stood all day outside Latrobe's office to press him for land for the Bunurong. He was not admitted. Kunai from Gippsland also pressed for country to cultivate through Thomas. The import of the words station and reserve are thrown into stark relief in these machinations of expulsion and removal. Next heading, Pound Bend. In 1840, Assistant Protector William Thomas drew up a map of his protectorate of Western Port, which took in Port Phillip and the settlement of Melbourne. He marked the waters of the bay as Nurm, as we'd expect early colonist Anderson appears. So do you see, if I make this bigger, do you see Anderson, Dawson, Newman, Gardner, Ryrie? Okay, so yep. Pound Bend is in this squiggly bit here, right? Mm, as we expect, early colonist Anderson appears running cattle on 397 acres with Bill Yalek, Anderson's Creek, running through his property. It's not marked there. To Anderson's right is James Dawson, who ran cattle on 697 acres. So Dawson actually went off to um, uh, um, Framlingham and became uh, close friends and champions of the Gunditjmara. As well as noting their runs, Thomas marks in a few splitters, house, uh, splitters huts southeast of the Bolin, Bulleen Lagoon. You see it here. Thomas describes splitters of, of, as being of great annoyance to the blacks. So these most hundreds, mostly 640 acre allotments surveyed south of the Birrarung Yarra River were assigned by stakes near marked corner trees. So Dawson's acreage, for instance, was marked out on stringy bark, box and wattle trees. Given the top of topographical literacy of the Wurundjeri, these markings right through their established song line were likely no less an affront as graffiti tags over our fences today. To, to give a sense of how Wurundjeri Willem country was peremptorily divvied up in an 1841 survey by Nutt, um, it includes an, an as yet unpopulated table under the headings, contents, price, name of purchaser. In 1841, a number of settlers with stations, including William Ryrie up here at Yering, described the work of the Wurundjeri and the Tongarung that they were doing for them, cutting bark for roofing and tanning, washing sheep, sowing and harvesting crops, driving bullet teams, shepherding, working with horses, domestic tasks, fencing, grubbing, splitting, mortising, boarding, sorry, boring, digging and sawing. So they were in high demand along, along the Plenty River over here and along the Yarra, the Plenty Rivers up this way. Um, the men were also, so in 1839, Thomas said the Aboriginal labourers were so sought after and scarce, they were being decoyed from one master to another. The men were also reputed to be good stockmen. They were an essential part of the settlers' workforce. They were, they were remunerated mostly in bread, flour, sugar and tomahawks. Um, 
However, on the Plenty River, workers went out on strike in late 1852, protesting the discrepancy between their and European wages. But Thomas persuaded them to return to work for 15 shillings a week plus food. Thomas believed the European men with whom they laboured an almost universally debased population that they had passed on the venery to the women. These depredations and outrages did not go unchallenged. In early 1840, a resistance warrior dubbed Jackie Jackie, armed with muskets, pistols and spears, led attacks on shepherds and homesteads in Nilambic. He was actually Jagger Jagger, also known as Bora Bora. He was a nephew of Billabellary, the influential narrator for the Wurundjeri Willem, who held joint custodianship of the Greenstone Quarry I was talking about before. Anderson made a report about the stealing of potatoes. So here he is on his run. He, he walks over to, to the Pound Bend Reserve. It's not a reserve yet. He made a report about the stealing potatoes from his run next to Pound Bend that he had been and that he had been shot at when he approached the Black's camp, the ball whizzing past his ear. Anderson accused Jaggy Jagger, Jagger Jagger, as being the author of the outraged and demanded a warrant for his apprehension. So many warriors actually bought firearms in exchange for skins and bullen bullen or liar bird tails that they shot for settlers who prized the feathers. Anderson's report led to a standoff in which Jagger Jagger was arrested up here at Ryrie Station. The warriors had first retreated there under fire by border police under the command of H, um, HF Gisborne on the 13th of January 1840. Gisborne was also commissioner for ground, Crown Lands. Four of them managed to apprehend Jackie Jackie, Gisborne describing him as a very tall, powerful man who made a desperate resistance. While his men were sidetracked by warriors who fired on them from behind trees, drawing them into a swamp, Jagger Jagger got hold of a knife, cut the ropes which bound him, and ran off with the handcuffs on his wrists, acutely embarrassing Gisborne. Gisborne later wrote in his report to Latrobe, I am unable to account for them never having hit us as they are capital marksmen. Thomas claimed that 17 months after the fray, um, he, he explained the offence to the um, Wurundjeri Wurrung and that they showed contrition and two gave themselves up and there had been no further agitation or uh, alter, altercation with the Yarra tribe once considered the most dangerous. So the Battle of Yering was the major event in Wurundjeri resistance to white settlement in the Yarra Valley and a plaque has since been erected at the site to commemorate the battle. But by the 1850s, Wurundjeri Willem were recorded as begging in the streets of Eltham and at the Kangaroo Ground School in Melbourne's Outer North. At Deep Creek, a warrior set his rifle down on one Mrs Knee's kitchen table and demanded food. They were finally granted the Pound Bend Reserve downriver from Warrandyte in 1852. Thomas wrote in his journal that Robinson informed him Latrobe had granted the reserve on the 17th of October 1850 and traced it out on a site on his... Oh, that's no good a site on his map. Um, 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 he traced it out in his journal. Um, he actually didn't go there for another year, however. So you see this funny little lip of land here. This is the Pound Bend Reserve, but it's actually not over the end of the lip. It's here. And that says Anderson's here, and that's his Warrandyte. In, a, in an 1851 survey of Warrandyte Parish by T.R. Nutt, 1,103 acres of land at Pound Bend is designated as an Aboriginal reserve. All right. So there's Yarra Glen. Here's the Diamond Creek. So my sister's house was just up here, just on the corner of Black Calf Creek. This is Queenstown is now called St Andrews. Here's Yarra Glen and down here above Warrandyte on this funny little bit of land, little here, we have the Aboriginal Reserve. Yep. Um, the right bottom corner of this Nilambic Parish map shows the Pounder and Reserved, sorry, that's a different map, um, demarked as uh, seven, I think it is. Here it is, yes. Um, it was formally declared in 1852 and is marked on a parish map, a, a series of parish maps from 1853. Large gatherings have been recorded at the site of Pound Bend and in the vicinity. It was the route from Heidelberg to Hillsville and therefore a trading route and seasonal camp for the Wurundjeri clans. By the time the Aboriginal Reserve was formally set aside, however, gold had been discovered. Right here, guess where, 
That's Anderson's Creek. Is that what that says? No, there you go. Anderson's Creek's right here. That's the picture I showed you in the beginning. Gold had been discovered um, the year before in July 18, uh, in July 1851. So the reserves failed. The reserves future was ill-fated from its commencement. A rush to the area began in 1854 when it was initially known as the Caledonia Diggings and then Queenstown. After the Pound Bend Reserve was formalised, it was never actually staffed or occupied. It served as a distribution depot for flour, tea, sugar, soap, tobacco, annual blankets and occasional tomahawks. Thomas noted, however, when passing through this depot, which he did infrequently, the Wurundjeri Willem desired aught but a little tobacco, as the men in the locality, as we've heard, were mostly employed. They were labouring along the Plenty and Birrarung Yarra rivers, probably also the Diamond Creek, for settlers as weeders, gardeners, harvesters, wool washers, stock handlers and bullockies. Six years after gold was found in Anderson's Creek, Pound Bend was surveyed again in 1858. The gold warden and magistrate there, Charles Warburton and Kerr, was uh, required to supply testimony on the natives under his control for another select committee on Aborigines. As we've seen by now, the influx of settlers to the Caledonia diggings had profoundly affected the Wurundjeri Willem, and Carr was hardly sympathetic. He wrote they were mostly intoxicated from the great sly grog shops on the diggings, and said, I cannot suggest any plan by which the Aborigines of this country might be saved from ultimate extinction, nor can I resist confessing that I see no good likely to result morally, socially or commercially in the preservation of a race so utterly useless and irreclaimable, except it to be the desirability of preserving a few specimens of the lowest form of humanity. For the investigation of science, I do not think any efforts on our part could induce them to abandon their uncivilised and wandering habits. He was proved wrong in February 1859 by a deputation of seven Eastern Kulin men who asked Thomas to appeal to the government on their behalf. These people who could not be induced to settle were requesting Thomas secure 4,500 acres to take up and cultivate. Thomas forwarded it to the land board, but it was scuttled by the protest of squatters led by Hugh Glass, the wealthiest man in Victoria, also known to cheat Wurundjeri employees, and he was assisted by the corrupt member of the first 1851 Victorian Legislative Council, Peter Snodgrass. Instead, the Coolum were granted a mostly rocky, cold, isolated and unproductive reserve called Mohican Station, near now Buxton. Thomas described the work they had already done at their preferred selection at Asheron. Work done, he said, included cutting logs for and erecting four rail cultivation paddock fence, uh, grubbing trees from the 15 acre cultivation paddock, stripped bark for a store, grubbing and cleaning land for wheat, stripping bark and building their own winter mia meads, ploughed and furrowed five acres of wheat, fenced about one and a half acres of land for a garden, ploughed and laid out beds, walks, sowing the vegetable seeds, raking and cleansing the walks of grass. Despite this investment of their labour in their own land, the very cultivation by which Europeans claimed a prior right to First Nations wastelands, Snodgrass ordered them off. By 1854, even the tiny Aboriginal reserve at Pound Bed had lost much of its status, despite still being marked on an 1858 government survey. It was already being used as a cattle pound. Uh, let me just move along. No, move along. Come on. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll just take you back there. No, that's no good either. Maybe it's behind my gallery. I'll move you all. Yes, there we are. There he is. Um, so um, it, it was already being used as a cattle pound. You see it here on the right. Many claims for alluvial and quartz mining had been granted in the area since the discovery of gold at Anderson's Creek in 1851. Yet on an 1855 map of Nillenburg Parish, this one here, the Pound Bend Reserve is coloured pink and a warrior lolls indolently at the bottom of the demarked block. Given the work they were doing in the area, it's a bit insulting. 
By, by August 1861, the Deputy Surveyor General and the Land Board rejected the newly established Central Board appointed to watch over the interests of Aborigines request to maintain the warrant, to retain the Warrandyte Reserve because it was within 20 miles, five miles of Melbourne and seemed to encourage too many visits to the township. Pound Bend Reserve was formally closed in 1862. Robert Brass Smith requested land at Warri Yalek. Um, instead, where a station was gazetted in January 1862, but it was too close to goldfields and cancelled by December. An unofficial depot at Mordialic was divvied up for encroaching settlers in 1863. In 1862, the Duffy Land Act came into force and pastoral leases in the Arthur's Creek, Queenstown, St Andrews district were cancelled. The land was surveyed again and thrown open for selection. This act rendered 10 million acres, 4 million hectares of land, about 20% of the state of Victoria, available to selectors. The district around the Lost Pound Bend Reserve would soon become a major supply of Melbourne's fruits of the fruit. In 1860, the Central Board had more vigorously compelled Aboriginal people onto mission and reserve sites away from major towns. During this time, land for Aboriginal people was allocated at Kurunduk, Ebenezer, Lake Tyres, Framlingham, Lake Conda, Ramayak and Yelta, along with the extant Mount Franklin station. In 1859, clan leaders directly appealed to Gavin Duffy, the Victorian Minister of Lands, and he granted them land at Badgers Creek Hillsville for Corranduk Station. The son of Villa Bellary, Simon Wonga, became Narangator of the Woiwurrung clans following the death of his father in 1846. Wonga and his maternal cousin, William Barrack, would soon succeed, who uh, would soon succeed uh, Wonga as Narangator in 1874, led their remaining people across the Black Spurs Song Line to the Upper Yarra and established Corundurk Mission Station located on the lands of the Wurundjeri Bullock as part of an outstation of Ryries. The Pound Bend site was part of Burrock's father's country. Importantly, the land granted by Duffy at Corundurk was not freehold. Settlers soon saw how successful their hop farm had become. Produce, it, its produce won first prize at the, at the Melbourne International Exhibition in 1872, and the reserve land was deemed too valuable for Aboriginal people to go on occupying. Reverend John Green championed Wurundjeri clan's rights at Corundirk until sacked by the Central Board. The residents petitioned to have uh, Green reinstated. William Barrack and his nephew, Robert Wandon, became key witnesses in the 1881 Parliamentary Corundirk Inquiry, along with other residents in the fight to retain their reserve. In 1866, the Parliament of Victoria passed an act to provide for the protection and management of Aboriginal natives of Victoria, also known as the Half Castes Act. This legislation was a de deliberate attempt to close missions and reserves that the government considered no longer economically viable. Under the act, only full blood Aboriginal people and half caste Aboriginals over the age of 34 could receive a government assistance on allocated reserves. And without a younger workforce, the stations became unviable. As a result of this legislation, which historian Richard Broom has called cultural genocide, many Aboriginal people were forced off the reserves that had become their home and separated from the fam those family members who could stay. The Aboriginal Protection Board closed Kurundurk in, in 1924 and the land was divvied up for the Solda Settlement Scheme in 1944. The remaining communities were concentrated at Lake Tyres. The attempted closure of Lake Tyres and Framlingham by the Aborigines Welfare Board in 1857 was met with fierce resistance. They were returned to their communities in 1870 under the Aboriginal Land Acts, Lands Act. To conclude, a farmer's common for cattle and horses was established on the Pound Bend site in 1861 and remained there until 1947. A paddock of 13 and a half acres had been set aside for police purposes there, and in 1863, the police commissioner requested it be formally declared the police's temporary reserve. The Evelyn Gold Mining uh, Company blasted. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on. It's very annoying. Uh, blasted a tunnel through the bend. My dad has canoed through there. Um, 
that opened in July 1870, but returns on the investment were poor and the company liquidated within a year. The five kilometre stretch of the Birrarong Yarra River, that thumb-shaped thumb parcel of land around the old reserve was dredged for gold. Some Wurundjeri Willem continued to live on creekside encampments or work on local stations until the 1920s. In 1935, the Shire of, the, of Doncaster and Temple so applied to the Forest Commission for a section north of Anderson's Creek to become a park, but were refused on grounds that it was a timber reserve. Um, yet on a 1937 survey, survey, it is marked as a public recreational reserve. The first Australian youth hostel was built at Pound Bend in 1940, and a Boy Scout camp is later marked on a Board of Works map. It is currently a particularly tranquil and sheltered picnic spot with a series of panels erected explaining Wurundjeri Willem connection to the spot. This one parcel of land was, within two years of it being allocated an Aboriginal reserve, taken up by cattle, then police mounts, then farmers' livestock, then timber, and finally recreation. The movement of First Nations Victorians onto these transient reserves had disastrous implications by fragmenting kinship systems and prohibiting language and cultural practices. The story of how reserves were set aside for people subjected to depression shows the desperation with which they fought for their survival and the implacable greed of the colonial administrators. As Bruno Latour writes of nation states, there's never any overlap between what lies inside their borders and what lies outside, but nevertheless allows them to prosper. But in the colony of Victoria, such reserves were internal. They map out the shadow states, Coolin Estates, in which the Port Phillip district found itself enfolded, then did its utmost to sequester into reserves and deny. This disconnect was evident in the Pound Bend Reserve, where displaced Wurundjeri Willem from the district were rationed. Such reserves were where Coolin survived, but they were also tiny territories that, that charted the paradox between the areas settler colonials live on and those they effectively live off. And that's me. Sorry if I went, and went on too long. <laughs>